You don't have to pee. You don't have to pee. You don't have to pee. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Let's say you've just built a model boiler, or you're refurbishing an old one, or maybe you've got an old air compressor, and you want to know if the pressure vessel is safe. How do we do that without, you know, putting ourselves at risk of going boom? Well, I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Quick safety note before we get started, pressure vessels, even model boilers, can be dangerous, so do your homework and have some idea what you're doing before you take on a build or a repair like this, and be aware of whatever your local laws are governing boilers. Uh, where I live, boilers under 100 PSI don't need to be certified or inspected, so a little hobby project like this is just fine. So how do you test a boiler to make sure that it's safe, that it's not going to explode on you? We do that with a process called hydrostatic testing. What you do is you fill the boiler with water and then you pressurize the water. Because water doesn't compress like a gas, it can't build up any explosive energy. So if there is a leak or a crack or some flaw in the, in the boiler, all that's gonna happen is water is gonna leak or spray out, all perfectly safe. So that's why we do it this way. Let's take a look at the process. Here's the boiler that I'm going to test today. I built this thing a few years ago, so it's due for a new hydrostatic test. And uh, this will give me a good excuse to go through all of the fittings that you typically see on one of these. Now this is an electric boiler, which is not very common, so you can see there's an electrical cord there. I'll show you how that works in a minute. And then this is the feed pipe for the engine. It's got the lagging on it. And then uh, you can see how it's got an electrical box on one end there. The enclosed end of the boiler there has the heating element in it. And then there's an output up top here from the steam dome for feeding the engine. And hey, this is the first thing I ever silver soldered and the first boiler I ever made. So don't look at it as an example of quality workmanship, but that doesn't mean we can't make sure it's safe. Step one is to prepare the shell for the test pressure that we're going to be using, which for a model boiler is typically 2x working pressure. Don't go higher than necessary, like more is not necessarily better. If you start thinking, oh, I'm going to test it to 4x working pressure to make sure it's super safe, you can actually damage the structure of the shell by doing that, and you're doing yourself no good. But all these accessories are not built to operate at the test pressure that we're going to be using, so these all have to come off. That's the main steam delivery pipe there, and here's the safety valve coming off of there. The safety valve is rated for 60 PSI, which is the working pressure of this boiler. Next, we got to get the water gauge off of there. So there's a little blanking plug in the top, and then there's these little gland packing nuts here that uh, unscrew. They're just finger tight because the glass is very delicate, and there's O-rings underneath there. So once those are loose, then the glass tube will slide straight out the top. This is always the scariest part for me. I'm always terrified of breaking these tubes. And then these fittings on thread from the top here as well. I made all of these fittings to adapt that water glass to this boiler. And then there's a street elbow here at the top that comes out. So we've got to strip it down to just the bushings that are soldered into the boiler. So we do the same thing at the bottom. And then we've got the blowdown valve over here as well. Again, that all needs to come out. There's a right angle boiler bushing in the bottom there. That stays in because that's soldered in place, but everything else comes out. Over here we have the pressure gauge. It has a little siphon tube on it, which creates a barrier of water like the S-trap in a toilet to protect the gauge from the steam. And then this has a little elbow on it as well that comes out. And this brass knob pulls straight out. This is keyed on the end there, as you can see, and that fits into the thermostat. And that elbow pipe is actually hiding the wiring, as you can see here underneath. The wiring runs from the thermostat at one end to the electrical box at the other. So this vertical pipe slides down slightly, which allows the elbow to come loose at the top. This pipe is just decorative to hide the wiring. But uh, yeah, when I put this together, I didn't think about how to disconnect the wiring. So I'm going to have to cut this, and I'll put a connector in it for next time. So with those cut just below the solder joints there on the thermostat wiring, I can pull that out. You can see that there's a ground wire there as well. All the metal parts on this thing are all grounded because this is, after all, a toaster in a bathtub. Now I can feed the wiring out of the elbow, and that end of the boiler is free. Over into the electrical box now, I'm detaching the electrical connections on the heating element. That white block there is an AC contactor, which allows the thermostat at the other end to control the one kilowatt immersion heater that's inside the boiler and hold a certain temperature and by extension a certain pressure. And there's a ground wire buried in there on the base of the heating element as well, so that comes out. 
And now here's the sad state of the brackets that hold the boiler. This one broke and I've been holding it up with a machinist jack. So I'm gonna have to fix that at some point. But uh, for now, I will support the other end with a machinist jack and get those straps disconnected so I can pull the boiler free of the stand here. So these legs just have bolts on the end and they run through bushings that are on the back side of those straps. And you can see that they are spring loaded because they're under tension from below. And then once the bolts are removed from both sides, I can get the whole bracket free. And you can see how that works. There's a strap that goes all the way over the top and then the bottom strap is split and has the tensioning bolt in it. So this worked fine mechanically, but clearly was not strong enough since one of them fatigued and broke at the other end. So that'll be a future repair. Now out comes the boiler. It is free of the stand, finally. Result. Into my box of steam bits here because I need to find blanking plugs for all of those boiler bushings and openings there. Luckily I have a bunch of these from when the boiler was first built and I pressure tested it the first time. And I'm one short because of course I am. Ugh. Okay, over to the lathe. I gotta make one more blanking plug. So I got some hex bar stock here that I'm gonna make this from and I'm just gonna turn down a little plug here. And there's remnants of some previous plumbing fixture on the end there, so I'll just turn that down. Brass is fun on small lathes because you can take basically infinite depth of cut. I'll get some length of bar here. I'm just copying one of the existing plugs, so I'll just get my dimensions eyeballed from that, make room for the parting blade, and then turn down a section of it to be round here. Hex bar stock is a gift from above for model engineers. It just makes it so easy to make these little plumbing fittings. I'll put a nice generous chamfer on there because I'm going to be cutting a tapered thread into this, which is a little bit difficult to get started sometimes. So here's my threading die. The fittings on this boiler are all 1 8 NPT, National Pipe Thread, which is a tapered thread. And that seemed like a good idea at the time, but I don't think I would do that again because tapered pipe threads are a pain in the patootie to work with. And it's really not necessary for the pressures involved in a little model boiler like this. So next time I would probably just make everything quarter 40, something like that. I'll say this though, these pipe threads seal extremely well. Like with very little effort, they get an excellent seal. So I guess that's what they're for. But anyway, I can now part this off and chamfer that edge a little bit. And Yahtzee. Speaking of sealing, I'm gonna be putting this stuff on all these threads. These are Loctite 569 and 545. As far as I can tell, they're basically the same thing. I have no idea why I own both. I'm gonna use the 545. It's a liquid hydraulic and pneumatic thread sealant. The secret ingredient in this stuff is witchcraft. At least I assume so because somehow it magically seals anything. I have made some truly terrible fittings in my time and Loctite 545 or 569 ensures that none of them have ever leaked. I've seen it rescue some really, really terrible fittings. Next, we're gonna need a hydrostatic test pump. Now there's lots of versions of these things, but I'll show you a couple. Here's one, but they all have very similar components to them. There's gonna be a handle, which is what allows you to pump water into the boiler and build up the pressure. And then there needs to be a ball valve on it so that once the pressure is built up, you can close off the system and then any leaks that happen are in the boiler. And then there needs to be some way to feed water in. In this case, it has a garden hose fitting on it, which is a bit unusual. And then there's gonna be a pressure gauge on there as well so you know what the pressure in the system is. Now here's a more traditional version. It has all the same components, but instead of a garden hose fitting, it has a water tank on it because you really don't need very much water for this. You only need like a cup full of water to pump into the boiler. This style is quite a bit more convenient. The garden hose one I bought because it seemed like a good idea and it turns out to be actually really messy because there's just way more water than you need. Now I'll stop here and say, you don't have to have something nearly this fancy. These things are not that expensive on Amazon, which is why I own two of them for some reason, but really any basic water feed pump will work if you've got a pressure gauge rigged to it. And I'll direct you over to Myford Boy, who's got a video about pressure testing model boilers using nothing more than a squirt bottle. Believe it or not, squirt bottles can indeed handle the pressure for small models. So don't feel like you need to have all of this fancy kit. Next, we need to attach the pump to the boiler. And it doesn't actually matter where the pump is attached, but you need to be able to fill the boiler from the highest point you have to minimize the air that's going in. So I have a fill plug over here and I'm gonna be attaching the pump to the steam dome because I have a vent plug on the other side that I can pull out and finish topping it up with the pump. So I'll just thread that on there. Oh, 
no, hmm, no, that doesn't, doesn't it's a little bit loose, so, yep, 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 there we go, perfect. 120 PSI, here we come. Now, I could buy an adapter for this, but I'm pretty sure I can make it in less time than it would take me to find it in the plumbing aisle at the hardware store. So I've got this piece of scrap here that has a boss left in it, right in the worst possible, get, just, just no way to grip, mm. oh, fine, I guess that'll have to do. So I'll start by facing this off, as is tradition. There, see? I said it. Are you not entertained? All right, I'll square up the tool post here and turn down the OD for the fitting that I'm going to need. The fitting that came on the end of the pump is an M14 by 1.5 metric thread, and then my boiler has a 1.8 NPT on the steam dome there. So that's the adapter that I am making. Like I said earlier, brass is so fun on a small lathe because you can take big girl cuts, and I got a little carried away having so much fun that I overshot the dimension by a lot. Standard imperial fist shake, and so I made the part again, this time to the proper dimension. I'll just break that corner. I'm gonna mark where the threads need to be. I'm leaving space at the top here to put a hex on there for a wrench. And I'm just gonna start by putting a threading groove in here. Now, M14 by 1.5, I do not have a die that size. So if only there was some sort of machine that could cut any arbitrary thread. Now, I'm no engineer, but I'm pretty sure such a machine doesn't exist. Wait a second, what does that lever do? Okay, okay, I'll single point cut the thread. I was actually going to buy a die for this, and then I priced out M14 by 1.5 dies, and I was suddenly very motivated to swap the change gears and cut this by single pointing it. So my scratch pass looks good. I'm at 1.5 millimeter, and away we go. Now I'm cutting metric threads with an imperial lead screw, so I'm using the method where you leave the half nut engaged, and I just power the lathe back and forth. And as usual for me, I've got the threading tool upside down, and I'm cutting with the lathe running backwards away from the chuck, especially with metric threads, it's much lower drama because you're not powering towards the chuck with the half nut engaged. Now when powering it back, I just stop it short and I wind it into the groove by hand. So that way there's no drama. A whole bunch of passes later and I should be really close. So I'll do a test fit here with the hose. And it threads about halfway on, starts to get tight. So we're not quite there yet. So I'll do one more spring pass. And one more test fit and see if we're there. You'll know you've got it if the hose gets rigid at the end there, because that's where the sealing surface actually is. If it doesn't lock up that movable joint, then it's not properly tight on there. And I'm gonna break that sharp edge and yeah, it still feels a little bit sharp, so I'm going to touch it up with a file as well. I want to make sure there's no burr or any kind of rough spot on the end there so it doesn't tear up the o-ring that's going to be sealing in there. And I'm not chamfering that end because it needs to be a flat sealing surface. And you may have noticed I made kind of a mess with my half-baked threading groove at the beginning there, so I came back in with a half-round tool so that I can sleep at night. If anybody asks, I made that groove first like you're supposed to. And now I can center drill and drill this fitting out so that it can fulfill its raison d'etre, which is to pass water through it from one weird thread to another weird thread. And I'll pick a good length to part it off at. Again, trying to leave enough for a wrench flat there at the top. And go in a little ways, and then come in there with the file, break that corner, and part the rest of the way off, and... Eh, Yahtzee. I probably should have done those exterior threads last, but I didn't, so I need to flip it around and kind of grip it on that narrow area plus a little bit of the threads, and so the collet chuck is the perfect tool for that. And with that, I can just face off the other side, clean it up, and counter bore it for the 8th inch NPT thread that needs to go in this end. Now in comes the 8th NPT tap. It's always sort of alarming how beefy these pipe taps are. And as you get close to the end, they can get very, very tight indeed. They are quite unpleasant threading tools to work with. Quick test fit with one of my existing fittings that I know is a good fit, and that looks good. Okay, so there's the little adapter. And this is the point where I realized I had not left enough wall thickness for the wrench flats that I wanted on there. So I'm going to tighten this thing with Scotch-Brite and pliers like a barbarian. This is not a permanent fitting, it's just a temporary thing for this pressure test, so it'll be fine. 
and then I can put the o-ring in there and tighten the hose on there and snug everything down and we should be good to go there. Now I'm going to pre-fill the boiler as much as I can through the fill plug. If you don't have a fill plug on your boiler, a lot of people just take the safety valve out and uh, use that hole for this purpose. You can also just pump the boiler full, but that takes a long time. So I'm just going to fill it here as high as I can from the fill plug, and then we'll rely on the pump to fill the last little bit there up into the steam dome, at which point I have to remove the plug on the other side of the steam dome to let the air out, of course and then put some water in the tank. And now you see why we really only need a handful of water because all we're doing is adding just enough water to fill the hose really and to start building pressure in the boiler. We're not actually pumping all of that water into the boiler. Then with the ball valve open so water can flow into the boiler, I start pumping it up. And I just go halfway at this point to 60 PSI and then close the ball valve and let it sit there Take it up in stages, especially for a new boiler. You may find leaks at this point, but if not, it allows the shell to work hard in a little bit and just equalize the whole structure there. And then I'm just checking, make sure there's no wet spots anywhere. Everything is dry, so after a minute there, I open the valve again and I pump it all the way up to my test pressure. In this case, 120 PSI, which is two times working pressure. Close the valve again, and then I'm giving it a good thorough once over, looking for any moisture anywhere. I did find a little bit of moisture right in between these two bushings in here. Now if this had been a big leak, like water was actually dripping out of there, then you'd want to drill it out and redo the solder joint. But it's just like moisture that appears here gradually over time. So there's just like a microscopic porosity in there. So what I can do is gently drain the pressure back out with the bleed valve here on the pump. And then with the pressure relieved on the boiler, then I can come in there with a flat bottomed punch, not like a sharp center punch. And right in the area where the moisture was forming, just give it a punch. And that'll just collapse whatever microscopic porosity was in there. And this is surprisingly effective. You can fix leaks very easily this way. And then I just pump it back up again and let it sit. Now the goal is to have it hold two times working pressure for about 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, no more signs of that moisture that I had there. You'll note that I'm wearing a face shield because even though this is a hydrostatic test, still 120 PSI is not something to joke around with. And you can see that I lost a little bit of pressure there over the course of 20 minutes. Everything is bone dry on the boiler. So this could be something in the pump or one of the seals on my blanking plug, something like that. I'm not going to claim this passed with flying colors, but eh, let's call it driving colors. It's pretty good. It's good enough for now. It's certainly safe and it'll get the job done here for the short term. I am actually going to build a new boiler with everything that I learned building this one. I think the next one will hopefully be a lot better than this. Last thing to do is test the safety valve. This is a commercial unit that I bought because I didn't trust myself to make a safety valve and so I'm not very worried about it, but I'll check it anyway just to be sure. So I'm going to remove my low pressure gauge from the regulator and put on the high pressure gauge. That low pressure one only goes to 20 psi. This regulator conveniently has a blanking plug on the back that's a lot shorter than I expected. Anyway, that'll be a good place to attach the safety valve for testing. Happens to be the same thread, which, you know, when do we ever get that lucky in life? Attach the compressor, open the ball valve, and then I can just ease the regulator up and somewhere around 60 PSI, that valve should go off. And that startles me every time, no matter how ready for it I am. Here's that from another angle so you can see what it looks like. Safety sidebar. If you're building a new boiler, there's a very important test you have to do on the safety valve. You need to do a full steam test with the boiler fired until that safety valve goes off, and you need to see that the safety valve can evacuate steam faster than the heat source is building that steam. If not, the boiler is going to overpressure the safety valve has to be able to overpower the heat source and empty that boiler out. If it can't, then that's a very dangerous situation. I've already done that test on this boiler, and honestly, because this is an electric boiler, you can kill the heat source instantly anyway, so it's really less of a concern than, for example, on a model locomotive where you might have a coal fire, and there's no way to instantly shut off a coal fire, which is, in fact, why locomotives typically have a way to drop the fire right out of the bottom of the engine in just such an emergency. 
That's the basic process for hydrostatic testing a boiler to make sure that it is safe. I hope you found this useful and interesting and hey, maybe even funny, who knows? If you did, maybe throw me a little love on Patreon. There's a link here at the end of the show and down in the show notes below. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.